In Psalm 100, verse 3, the psalmist says, We are His people. Thanks, Dan. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. What does that mean to you? We are God's people and the sheep of His pasture. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your living word today. And I ask you to go deep to the core of our identity today. Help us know who we are. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. In our news recently is a story about a 24-year-old girl and her father who were murdered, allegedly, by her boyfriend, who was living with them. Um, Three days after it was in the news, I was sitting at the Maple Hill restaurant here for breakfast, and a gal and her grandmother came in and sat in the booth behind me. I know it was her grandmother, I wasn't by age, but she called her grandma. So, uh, you know, it was pretty easy to figure that out. I wasn't eavesdropping, but you don't have to be eavesdropping to have your attention caught by the conversation right behind you in a booth. And I heard the girl say to her grandmother, uh, talk to her about this new story, about what, you know, what I had just kind of read about a few days before. And then she shared with her grandmother that she was good friends with the girl who was one of, with, she's good friends with a girl who was one of the best friends of the girl who was killed. Now, this is all hearsay, obviously. I'm just listening. But so I'm listening to a girl who is at least telling her grandmother, I'm really good friends with a girl who was one of the victim's best friends. And that girl said about the victim that she had tried to tell her to get away from this guy. But she had let him convince her that she was not worth anything and she needed him. The girl went on to say to her grandmom that she, this girl believed her boyfriend when he told her nobody else wanted her. And the girl said to her grandmom, I'm so glad I have people like you, grandmom, that make me feel valuable. When I heard that conversation, I knew what I was speaking on today, and I thought, wow, does that apply? What am I worth? What is your value? Do you base your value on the negative words your boyfriend has to say about you? Do you base your value on the positive words your grandma has to say about you. Am I worth more this week if I got a new job? Am I worth less if I lost my job? Am I worth more this week if I got a girlfriend and I'm worth less this week if she broke up with me? Do I feel more valuable if my hair turned out the way I wanted it to turn out that morning, right? Am I worth more if I make the decision to run the ball from the one-yard line rather than pass it? (laughs) Those of you who saw the Super Bowl, right, with a minute left? Is my value like the stock market? Is my value and my worth tied to who is buying my value today and who is selling my value today? Or do I have a true book value? Does this book, the Bible, declare to me my true value? The first thing I want us to to see today as we look at at this is our fluctuating self-worth. Our self-worth will fluctuate, mark it down. First off, we're human beings. 
We all are. We're, are, we're you know, broken by sin. We're, we're insecurities, vulnerabilities. So we're all going to you know, wrestle. And, and, and just when we feel like I finally you know, got my thoughts in the right place, we're going to struggle. And, you know, that. But we are going to fluctuate. Our self-worth, our sense of self-worth is going to fluctuate if it is based and determined by two different sources. The first one is the approval of others. The approval of others. If you look at John's Gospel, John chapter 12. Now as you're turning there, I want to say something to you. I'm realistic. I'm living in the real world. I'm not acting as if, it doesn't matter what anybody says, it never affects me. I am just so spiritually in tune with the Father. Like, we, 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 we get impacted, and we're supposed to. We're going to look at that next week. The impact that we make on the affirmation of others' value, the value of another human life, many different ways we can do that. Certainly, God designed for Adam to affirm to Eve her worth, but he was affirming to her the worth that God gave her, and vice versa. We'll see that. But in John chapter 12, we read something about the Pharisees in John chapter 12. We read in verse 42, nevertheless, John's gospel, chapter 12, verse 42, many even of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Now again, I want to be practical. I like when people are happy with me, right? That's all right, right? I, we like when somebody affirms us in some way. It's, it's okay, all right? I, that, that, that's part of our interaction. We know that our relationships, we're told in Scripture, build up one another, encourage one another. The, the meaning is deep. It's not just say something nice about them. But the point isn't that they cared about the point is what the verse of Scripture says. They loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. In other words, their sense of self-worth and, and whatnot was built on what others were saying. And that causes a problem. Because if you turn back in Scripture to 1 Samuel chapter 18, and uh, if you're new with the Bible, hey, do not be embarrassed at all that you're looking at the person next to you and seeing which direction they're going. That's okay. None of us pick up the Bible and know where we're going the first time. So what we care about is, is His Word, and, and we, we certainly uh, encourage you to kind of get to know it. But First Samuel there in the Old Testament, First Samuel chapter 18, and in First Samuel chapter 18, we read a fascinating story that to me is kind of linked in with this approval of men, right? In 1 Samuel chapter 18, we read in verse 6, It happened as they were coming when David returned from killing the Philistine that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. The women sang as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And then Saul became very angry for this saying, displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, but to me they have ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul gets angry. He's jealous. But why? Because he is basing, in one sense, his, his worth, his value on what others are saying. And what Saul is hearing is, hey, they are selling stock in Saul and they're buying stock in David. My value is dropping. And that's why our sinful human tendency to make ourselves feel better is to tear other people down. And that's a, uh, that, that, that what we see, you know, somebody that's always tearing down others, it's the easiest way to kind of, you know, make yourself feel better. Listening to the approval of others, it, 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 you're going to fluctuate. Matter of fact, the opposite is true. The other's people may be approving you, and they shouldn't be. We have a, in our world today is that sense of, hey, let's cheer whatever. The, the greatest quality is to approve of what everyone does. Oh, we approve of what you're doing. And that's, look at, look at King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 3. 
In Daniel chapter 3, he builds a statue to bring himself glory, and I'm the great, you know, king, and his, you know, you know all of his priests, and pri- they're all, oh, you're so great. Oh, he's getting great. You know, his self-worth, he's being told how great he is. The problem is, God is about to say to him, you're nothing without me. So our worth will fluctuate if it's determined by the approval of others. It also will fluctuate if it's determined by my own ability. In other words, if my value is based on my looks, right? Now listen, there's nothing wrong with looking in the mirror saying, you know what, I'd like to look a little differently than I look at this moment. And, you know, and that, there's, there's nothing wrong with wanting to do things to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. Or, or look to, I used to look in the mirror for several years and there was a mustache there. And I just decided, you know, I think without the mustache I'm going to look better. And so I got rid of the mustache a while, while back, right? And um, that's a, that, listen, that, I'm not talking about, you know, don't care what you, you, you know, what you look like in any way, shape, or form. What I'm saying is this. If your value is based on what you see in that mirror, if your value is based on your abilities to play basketball or this or that, if your value is based on your accomplishments, well, uh, if my SAT score was the top of... What does Solomon tell us in Ecclesiastes in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, he makes a statement that reminds us of being careful about that. Because in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 11, he says this, I again, Ecclesiastes 9, 11, I again saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift and the battle is not to the warriors and neither is bread to the wise nor wealth to the discerning nor favor to the ability of men. For time and chance overtake them all. In other words, the fastest runner may trip and fall. The strongest person may get sick. When you look in the mirror 60 years from now, you will not look the way you look now. Right? If your worth is built on the approval of others or your own abilities and attributes, it is going to go up and down and up and down and all, all over the place. I want to contrast that. I want to contrast that today with a second thing that we want to see, and I'll move along here. God's absolute worth. God's absolute worth. Do you ever think about how God feels about himself? Have you ever thought about God's self-image? We don't don't really think in those terms, right? But turn, if you would, to Psalm 115 and kind of, let's, let's think about the worth and value of God that he is aware about of himself. For in Psalm 115, Psalm 115, we read in verse 3, But our God, Psalm 115 and verse 3, But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever He pleases. And when you realize that, you understand what the psalmist is saying in verse 2, Why should the nation say, Where now is their God? The psalmist is saying, God is in the heavens and He does whatever He pleases. Do you think it affects him if you're saying, yeah, where's God? What kind of God? Do you think anybody's opinion of God affects him in any way? No. we, We can't quite fathom it. We understand the truth of it. We're so affected by our own humanity. But God is not impacted by your opinion of him. He's not affected by it. He he is who he says he is. And he declares that. I know I'm moving around today and you can follow me or just listen to me. But he declares that in Isaiah chapter 46. Many of you know this verse well. 
Isaiah chapter 46, he says to us, I want you to know my self-image. I want to tell you how I see myself. In Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 9, he says, Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done. Saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. I am God. There is no one like me. When I was a kid, Muhammad Ali was in the boxing ring and on the TV. and I was not an Ali fan because... I love Joe Frazier. He was a Philly guy, and so I was a Frazier fan, right? But Muhammad Ali, there's no mistake in the fact that he was a dynamic boxer, tremendous, and he let everybody know, I am the greatest. Right? I, I'm not, I don't have him down, but I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest. And if we put Muhammad Ali in a boxing ring today with one of the top boxers of our day, he'll be lying unconscious on the mat in seconds. And I'm not saying that with you know animosity toward Muhammad Ali. I'm saying this. There is a very big difference between Muhammad Ali saying, I am the greatest, and Almighty God saying, I am the greatest. Because God is the greatest and always will be the greatest and has never not been the greatest. My point is, we are talking about the eternal, matchless, incredible God. He is always completely perfect. He's never frustrated. Never. Oh, we read verses that where he tries to, in, in language for us to understand, speaks about, you know, how the, you know, the world before Noah, you know, displeased. But he is, God is never frustrated. He's never up. He's never down. Never lacks self-esteem. He is always completely secure. And that's why we said last week, my soul thirsts for the living God. Why? Because I know He will satisfy me. Why? Because He never stays in bed because He's feeling down. Matter of fact, He never gets in bed because He's tired. Right? He never says... You know, back in the Old Testament days, I felt pretty confident about myself. But now the way people are responding to me, I'm starting to wonder, you know. I'm starting to, you know, never. John Piper, when he reads Isaiah 46 and verse 9, he says, God must be the happiest of all beings. And I understand what he's saying. God is eternally secure in himself he is eternally joyful with himself. And so let's put it together. Because of that, because he is eternally the perfect, complete, secure God, he didn't need to create us. He didn't need to. He didn't come along and feel like, it, this isn't like God creating Adam and saying, you know what, we need to create Eve. This isn't God saying, I'm, I'm missing something. He doesn't miss anything. He wasn't lacking anything. And therefore, the only reason that he could have possibly created us was of his own will. He willfully, purposefully created us so that He could place a value on us. Love us so that we might see His value and love Him and glorify Him and worship Him. We love Him because He first loved us. And that's the third thing we want to see. The worth that God declares of us. At the heart of it is this. My identity... Who I am. How I feel about myself. I'm not talking about when I'm sinning and I'm struggling with guilt over it. That, I need to face my sin, 
face the guilt, confess it, repent. I'm talking about my identity, my worth is rooted in the worth of God. I'm not saying I'm God. We're not going to do age here that we're, you know, God broke up into all these different particles and once we get all back together, we're, you know, like I'm saying the almighty, perfect, secure, confident, pure God created us and my worth is rooted in his value because he's the one who declares my worth. We write resumes and and I understand we write resumes, you know, you got to put in there. Stuff you did, right? You're trying to give them a reason to think think something good about you, and so we put in a resume. You know, we this is the this is the schooling I went to, and these are the jobs I had, and I accomplished this, and I accomplished that. And kind of at the end, we put in the references. And if you ask these people, they'll tell you I'm not lying. They'll they'll say you know that this these things are true. You know, when it comes to my sense of worth and value, it's the opposite. I list nothing. What am I worth? I point you to one reference. My worth is rooted in the fact that God declares I have value. That God declares that He loves me. If you look back to Genesis, we'll just do this quickly, but Genesis chapter 1, Adam's worth, he knew what it was rooted in. It was rooted in God's worth adam was only worth anything because god was worth everything and that god who is worth everything declared to adam i have created you in my image and i have set a worth and a value on you and in genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 we read god said let us make man in our image according to our likeness And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God says, I have set this value on you. So much so that later in Genesis chapter 9, God says, Whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, because why? He was made in the image of God. That there is this incredible worth that God gives us. It comes from Him. You turn to Psalm 8. I love Psalm 8. And and I love it... Part of the reason I love it is because it's pretty clear when David wrote it, it's not in the morning, it's not in the middle of the afternoon. He almost, he tells us what's on his mind in Psalm 8, right? For in Psalm 8, he says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. What does he say in verse 3 of Psalm 8? When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, what's he looking at? The moon and the stars which you have ordained. Psalm 8 verse 3, he's looking up there at night time and he's just stunned by the vastness of it all. What is man that you take thought of him? And the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. You know, David is standing there saying, I am le- at this moment, not, maybe not tomorrow when I'm surrounded by a crowd, but at this moment there is nobody in this world who can make me feel insignificant. Because I am looking up at this vast sky and I am well aware of the fact That my value is rooted in what he has declared. That that God who made all of that has created us with such worth and value. This week was my birthday and uh, my wife and each of my children in a very precious way affirmed my worth to them. Many of you, and I'm deeply, deeply meaningful. It's very, uh, you know, 
It's nice, right? To, to have birthday wishes and to be affirmed. There's a purpose in that. God's designed our interaction. But I really believe this to be true. God wants the determining source of my worth to be what he declares. I know, you know my, my children, I don't ever anticipate it. Deanna's the only one here. If Deanna decided to one day, she could just decide, you know what? I don't like my dad. I don't like you anymore. I don't want to see you anymore. I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore, right? If my worth, it would hurt. Don't misunderstand me. I don't want anybody to think, you know, it would hurt. I would cry. I would chase her down or whatever, you know. But, 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 but my point is, it can't determine my worth. He has to be the one who determines my worth. Don't let that guy tell you you're only worth something to him as an object. Don't listen to that. Don't let that girl tell you you're only worth something to her if you make a lot of money. Don't let, don't let anybody shape your worth. Because God has declared it, and not only has He declared it, He has convincingly acted on it. Because Jesus said, God so loved this world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will never perish but have ever Lasting life. What did Paul say to the Romans in Romans chapter 8? For God did not spare his own son to redeem us. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about it, but I also don't want you to go nuts because sometimes when I think about it, I go nuts and I have to. I don't have an infinite mind. But God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have existed forever in perfect community. I've had people say, well, I don't believe in God. How, where did he come from? I can't tell you because my mind, I know that he has existed forever. My mind can't handle that. But... I can handle that a lot better than you're going to tell me that there was nothing and then there was something. From what? From where? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit somehow, somehow in eternity past, before there was ever a universe, before there was ever a human race, the Father and the Son have perfect eternal fellowship. And yet, when we as a human race sinned against God and destroyed our fellowship with Him, God did not spare His own Son. He did not spare His own Son to redeem us. And Paul says that. You see, what am I worth? According to my Father in heaven, according to my Father in heaven, I am worth the suffering of His Son and His sacrificial death for me. According to Jesus, I am worth Him laying down His life to pay for my sin. That's unbelievable. For my birthday, I got an email from Capital One, 360, their investing thing. <laughs> Happy birthday. You're a year older. You need to invest more money, right? Basically. Somehow when I got it, I didn't get this sense of 
They are celebrating my value and my worth. They, they just are so glad. No, you know what I mean? I didn't get that sense, right? But somehow, if every single one of you stood up right now in this room and booed, you booed me. Somehow, if every one of you, don't, again, don't miss, I'm not trying to be dramatic. I'm trying to make a point, a real point. It would hurt. <laughs> But somehow, if you all stood up and booed me and turned your backs and walked away, I can still look at the cross. And I can see Jesus Christ hanging on the cross. And he says to the eternal, secure, perfect God, Father, forgive Vincent. Because we love him. God values me. What are you worth? What are you worth? We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. That's what you're worth. Let's bow before the Lord. I don't know if you're here today and you have never been born again. You've never responded to the gospel. I want you to know God has placed a worth on you, not because of you, not because of your accomplishments, not because of your goodness. God has chosen to love you because he has placed his worth on you. And Jesus Christ valued you so much that he took your sin upon himself and sacrificed his life on the cross to pay for your sin. The Bible tells us that because of that, if you will confess your sin and put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior right this minute, God will forever forgive you of your sin and make you his child. Won't you do that right now in this quietness? Forgive me, God. I confess my sin. I believe you value me and love me. I confess my sin and I put all my faith in Jesus as my Savior. Forgive me, O God. Make me your child forever. Maybe you're here today and you came in here today beat down by the messages you've been getting about your worth. Listen. You need to claim the grace in the name of Jesus Christ that you will stand on God's truth. You have a book value. It is the Bible. And God speaks in it and he tells you, don't you listen to them. You have been declared valuable by the Creator. Run into His arms. Let Him tell you who you are. Lord God, I thank You. Thank You, O God, that we can know that. Lord, we live in a world, we're living in a society. People don't know who they are. They're losing their identity. They're struggling with, who am I? What should I be? Oh, Lord, we ask you, use us to bring the truth to others that our identity can only be found in you. We pray in your name. Amen.